and welcome to our special edition of Showcase. When it comes to magical journeys and fantastical characters, Roald Dahl definitely is one of the creme de la creme of children's authors. Born in the UK to Norwegian parents, young Dahl was a bookworm who loved stories that fired up his imagination. His favourite being those with ghosts. He was a pilot with the British Air Forces, survived a plane crash and even did a stint as a British spy. His first short story, Shot Down Over Libya, was published in 1942 by an American magazine. This proved to be just the beginning of a long and successful career. One of his most famous quotes is, those who don't believe in magic will never find it. So today on Showcase, we take a look at the man behind the magic. <laughs> Celebrated author Roald Dahl's hometown is honouring the man and his vivid imagination with a variety of events, including an array of exhibitions at the Roald Dahl Museum, where people are encouraged to get up close and personal with his work. I was hearing all the secret whisperings of the world. Please enter. Who are you? He's Willy Wonka. I don't care. I don't care. I love the chocolate. I can see that. No more, Miss Nice Girl. A dip face. Have a carrot. Nah, you eat it. A plethora of characters, all from one man's imagination. And to celebrate a hundred years since Roald Dahl was born, his hometown is pulling out all the stops. Here at the Roald Dahl Museum and Story Centre, it's all about the stories behind the stories. So Roald Dahl, like most writers, wrote from what he knew, wrote from his own life experiences and then mixed them up like the BFG mixes dreams. It's the fizziness of his language. Even in his letters home to his mother from boarding school, which we have here at the museum, you can see there's that energy, that kind of breathless excitement that's really marvellous about Roald Dahl. Born in Wales to Norwegian parents, Roald Dahl grew up in the English countryside. It's the backdrop to many of his famous children's stories. Well, well, well. I've got you this time. Diesel, you're in for it now, my lad. Dangerous driving. Driving without due care and attention. Ah, Sergeant, the very man I wanted to see. But it's the characters that have captured children's imaginations for more than half a century. From Willy Wonka, to fantastic Mr. Fox, to the big friendly giant. Why did you take me? The people populating Dahl's stories are still finding their way onto the big screen. It all started here, in this armchair, which was tucked away in a little shed at the bottom of Roald Dahl's garden. And here, surrounded by a collection of his favourite treasured objects, the writer would use this rather makeshift setup, picking up his desk and a pencil, and to this yellow-lined paper, he would commit the stories that we now know and love across the world. And now, I really feel like Roald Dahl. Dahl had a routine, writing four hours a day in two-hour stints. But he wasn't always a writer. He started his career as a fighter pilot, and his first published work was about a plane crash he suffered in 1940. He had limited success writing for adults, and it wasn't until his children were born that Dahl found fame, with stories he'd invented to tell them at bedtime. His characters speak gobblefunk, and this year visitors to the Roald Dahl Museum can have a whiz-popping time learning to tell a boot boggler from a hornswoggle. Belle Lupton, TRT World, Great Missenden. From children's stories to tales of the unexpected, it's time to talk about possibly one of the best storytellers of all time. And for that, I'm joined by literature critic and writer Tom Ward. First of all, congratulations on your new book, Dead Dogs and Splintered Hearts. It has just been released and is getting some great reviews. You say you were inspired by Dahl's book for one of the poems. Tell us about it. Has Dahl always been an inspiration? 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think every English writer, whatever they write, is inspired by Roald Dahl to some degree. Um, I wrote this poem in my book. It sort of, I woke up after reading, uh, falling asleep, reading his short stories, and just had the image of a bag of eyeballs in my head, which must have somehow come from his stories. So I imagined uh, a wife providing this as a present to her husband after she's been away, and the idea just came out of there, really. But I think it was inspired by uh, Roald Dahl's very strange twist of uh, reality. Some research shows adults read Dahl's children's books even more than the children themselves. Why, as adults, are we so fascinated by his books? I think because, like Harry Potter now, we've all grown up reading or having Roald Dahl books read to us, so it's part of our childhood, and I think they're a way of escaping from reality, but also understanding it a little bit more. Stories like Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, you have a child, it's, he's living in austerity, but he finds a golden ticket, he's chosen, and suddenly things become better for him. And as a child, what you want is to go into a sweet factory. As an adult, you might read that, and something else appeals to you. So it's very easy to imagine yourself in these situations. And I think the stories in that way are as relevant to an adult as to a child, and I think that's why they've endured for so long. Well, Dahl wrote for adults as well as children. In contrast to his children's books, his stories for adults were often dark and brooding. Please compare and describe how they differ. I think when you look at the start of Roald Dahl's adult short stories, they come from his experiences as a fighter pilot in North Africa in World War II. And his first book, Over to You, is a lot of... Um, it's like early Hemingway or J.G. Ballard when he, in Empire of the Sun talking about war, and it's very straightforward because I think the war is such a big subject that that is enough inspiration. But then when he comes back from the war, he becomes a lot more playful, and his short stories for adults um, take the everyday situation he's in with, and just provide a sense of mischief. And I think with children's books, because children have better imaginations and we, we all lose our imaginations and stop thinking in a certain way. I think Roald Dahl saw it as his mission to really disturb people as children so that they would take these weird images and this different way of thinking with them into adult life. So I think with children's books, he really let his imagination run wild, as we can see. Whereas for adults, um, I think he tried to disturb them in more subtle ways by looking at everyday aspects of their existence and just finding a slightly macabre twist on that uh, to chill and unnerve us. Mm -hmm. Well, there was some social criticism, life advice and even philosophy in his writing. How did he weave these into the stories? Um, yeah, I'd agree that there's social criticism in his stories. I mean, in his children's stories, it's much more obvious. You have the twits of the witches who are the bad guys, people like... Um, Willy Wonka, who are the saviors, and uh, Grandpa Joe are departing all this life advice. Um, in his adult stories, it's, it's less clear-cut, but it's often um, the people... I mean, if you read a newspaper, it's quite obvious who the villains are that Roald Dahl um, is referring to. You have people like company directors, you have um, your boss at work who's a little bit mean to you, you have the guy who's trying to steal your wife, perhaps. Um, so these people are, I'd say, the targets of Roald Dahl's adult work, mostly. Um, but often they get their way and they win in the end. And in a lot of his stories, the protagonist who you root for throughout, um, he doesn't get his way and he ends up in a worse situation. And I think that, as well, is a, a subtle life lesson there, that things don't always work out, even if you think you're one of the good guys. Definitely. Well, Tom, before we go, what are your favourite works by Dahl and why? I think one that really stands out is Skin, about a artist who's famous in his life and he's died. And a collector thinks he has all of this guy's work, but it turns out that the artist used to live with a tattoo artist. And one evening, the artist uh, actually tattooed the tattoo artist back. And this is his last remaining piece, the problem being it's a living piece. It's on the back of the tattooist who's still alive and well. And in this story, a rich hotelier um, decides that he can bring this tattoo artist to his hotel, put him up in a life of luxury, and in that way, he'll be a walk-in exhibition and testament to the deceased artist's prowess and uh, legacy. 
Uh, but it's only at the very end of the story that you find out that, in actuality, no one has seen the tattoo artist since he arrived at the hotel, but they do have a brand new painting on display, which is quite unnerving. Um, I also really enjoy his, um, the book on, uh, Uncle Oswald, um, and this character was introduced in a lot of short stories where it's a, m a mysterious long lost relative turns up and he's telling tales of um, escape into Egypt, he's meeting mysterious women, he's travelling the globe, he's, uh, the he's a typical rake um, and this is sort of like Indiana Jones but on steroids in a way and this uh, really appealed and I think more than anything it's worldwide well, pushing what you can get away with to the maximum and questioning whether you're actually going to like this character or whether you're going to be disturbed by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Tom Ward, thank you very much for joining us on our World Dial special. Here's one of Britain's best-loved authors, but Roald Dahl's fantastical characters are also perfect for the big screen. Let's take a look at some of the most famous movie adaptations of his work. His characters are often humorous. Surprises around every corner, but nothing dangerous. Don't be alone. Sometimes frightening but always unique. And they translate perfectly to the silver screen. The late, great Gene Wilder's career highlight came with playing the eponymous title character of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Released back in 1971, it was one of the earliest screen adaptations of Dahl's children's stories. But it wasn't his first foray into film. He had previous screenwriter credits for James Bond's You Only Live Twice Keep clear! and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. This is Caractacus Potts, inventor extraordinaire. Dahl himself was disappointed in the adaptation, and so it wasn't until the late 80s and early 90s that more attempts were made to transform his stories for the screen. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big and you're small. I'm right. And you're wrong. A live-action version of Matilda met with critical acclaim. Dahl's children's stories often have a hint of darkness. The Witches, about a young boy who stumbles on a witch's plot to rid the world of all children, featured a terrifying Angelica Huston when it was released in 1990. I don't care. The third era for Dahl's books came in the 2000s, with Johnny Depp taking on the role of Willy Wonka in 2005. Candy doesn't have to have a point. That's why it's candy. And then in 2009, Wes Anderson directed Fantastic Mr. Fox about one fox's trouble with his farming neighbours. It better not be. Actually, it was the first book I ever personally owned as officially my property. And it was uh, an, a, a book I loved as a child. And also, it, it was a book that introduced me to Roald Dahl's work in general. You know all the secret whisperings of the world. And the latest movie is Steven Spielberg's The BFG, released earlier this year. I have seven children. I, I read the book to a lot of my children growing up, so I became the BFG while I was the storyteller of that book. And I so know what it feels like to be BFG, at least with my kids below me and me above them with the book between us. Dahl may have died 26 years ago, but his stories and the big screen adaptations of them are as well loved as ever. Films based on Roald Dahl's books seem to become cult classics almost instantly, regardless of how they do at the box office. To talk about these timeless movies, I'm joined by digital culture writer for The Independent, Jacob Stolworthy. Jacob, what makes these movies so magical? Well, it's a funny one, really, because I think it's, uh, they're kind of like the anti-family films. Uh, so like Disney, they're kind of magical for the obvious reasons, the fairy tale aspect and things like that. I think the, the thing with Roald Dahl films is that they actually focus on the, uh, the more quirky, grotesque side of childhood. And because of that, I think that's why uh, families find them uh, so refreshing and in their own way, magical. Uh, I feel like uh, also because of that, they kind of focus on more mature films, that Disney films or, uh, or less grotesque films 
may focus on. So because of that, they, uh, they appeal to all the family. So they're perfect for sitting around with your parents, uh, with your brothers, with your sisters, and even with your grandparents. And, uh, and you know, you can experience that dull magic together. Mm -hmm. Well, any book lover will be quick to tell you the book was better. Roald Dahl famously loathed the movie adaptations of his books. Does this always mean the movie cannot stand on its feet? How do Dahl's book adaptations fare, as far as you're concerned? I mean, I think they can stand on their own feet, and I think the reason why that is is because uh, uh, Roald Dahl material uh, kind of gravitates towards directors with their own unique stamp. Uh, if you look at some of the directors who directed Roald Dahl adaptations in the past, uh, Nicholas Rogue, Mel Stewart, even Tim Burton, they're directors with their own, uh, you know, with their own stamp. And I feel that uh, for a, a good example is actually Nicholas Rogue's uh, film version of The Witches, which, uh, I mean, I, I can see why Dahl wouldn't like some of his uh, books being made into films, uh, especially films that should appeal to children, when that film is actually pretty scary like even for for me as a 25 year old i find that film pretty scary now but i think that it's a such a it's such a unique uh, original version of Roald Dahl's book that they can it can completely stand in its own two feet as a film by that director mm -hmm. well you did mention these at the start but are the adaptations becoming more family friendly and losing some of the edginess that you also mentioned such as in James and the Giant Peach and the Witches from the, the 90s yeah, um, I, I would say they are losing their, uh, their edginess uh, somewhat. And I think it's, it's kind of a shame, but I suppose it's because of the, um, uh, the distributors and the studios. Uh, back in the 90s, I feel there was no expectation. And films uh, like The Witches, like Matilda, they, and James and the Giant Peach, would not have uh, maybe done as well at the box office as uh, they would have done now, because I feel like if they were made now, they would have been uh, probably constructed with... Uh, uh, an element of the family friendly, whereas the, the films in the 90s, because of a lack of expectation perhaps, they were very uh, able to kind of stand, uh, stand, pride, uh, stand proud as uh, a bit of a cult film actually. And because of that now, we look back on them uh, with um, nostalgia and we look back on them as being better than the films that are released now. So the two that were released, the two that spring to mind now are Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Tim Burton and uh, the BFG, uh, the recent uh, film by Steven Spielberg. And they, uh, they definitely do shun the, uh, the more odd elements of Roald Dahl to kind of focus on the, uh, the schmaltzy side of, of relationships at the center of these films and these books. Mm -hmm. Well, we've recently lost Gene Wilder, who played Willy Wonka in 1971. What can you say about his iconic performance as Willy Wonka? Now, I'm probably biased because when I was about seven years old, I probably watched this film about eight times a day. But uh, what, what I can say is, as a child, right through to, um, to the age I am now, I view that performance as one of the best examples of a, uh, of, of, uh, a performance in, in a family film. And the reason for that is because I think he completely nailed what Willy Wonka should be. And what that is, he's, he's the kind of character who uh, you feel like you can rely on him. You feel that he is, uh, you know, that, that kind of sturdy uncle figure that you can uh, rely on for, for a laugh, uh, for advice. But the minute you cross him, he will probably push you uh, into, in, fr in front of a car. And, uh, you know, if you, say, if you say something he doesn't like. And I think that was so good about that role because he was so unpredictable, yet Gene Wilder being the comedic actor that he was, he was so lovable. And I feel that is exactly what that role needed. And because of that, I will, I mean, for me, it's the role that I will always remember Gene Wilder by, uh, even though there's lots of other roles that I, that I love of his. Uh, but that one, I think, was a performance of a lifetime. And uh, rest in peace, Gene Wilder. Jacob, definitely agree with all of that. But how about Johnny Depp, who played the same character in 2015? Uh, well, the thing with Johnny Depp is, back in the day, uh, back in his day, in the early 90s, uh, when he was working with Tim Burton as well, he was a bit of a, uh, he was a, bit of a, 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 a wild card, and he gave some very good performances, namely Edward Scissorhands and Ed Wood. But the problem with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is I feel that Tim Burton came, in, came uh, onto this film uh, with no other actor in mind apart from Depp. And I think that Depp had just come off, just come off the, uh, the success of Pirates of the Caribbean, 
which he got an Oscar nomination for, and roles like that don't usually earn Oscar nominations. And I felt like he tried to do the same again, but instead what he did was he kind of gave a very strange uh, off-kilter performance, which is not a problem, but I think it was basically, uh, it seemed inspired by Michael Jackson, even though he, he always claimed that that was never, never inten in intended. And uh, he claims he tried, to he tried to do a very different thing to what Gene Wilder, uh, Gene Wilder had done in 1971. But instead, I think he tried to homage the role without intending to, and through that, kind of, not disrespected it, but didn't do the job that he probably first thought that he, uh, he was doing. Inspired by Michael Jackson, I'd never heard that one before. But finally, the yeah. latest adaptation is Disney's The BFG, directed by Steven Spielberg. How did you find the movie, and where does it rank among the others? Now, uh, the BFG is a strange one for me. I didn't love it. Uh, a lot of my uh, friends and fellow journalists really enjoyed it. Uh, but for me, I felt like it was uh, a bit lazy. Uh, and not, it, not in the, uh, the, the visuals. The visuals were amazing. But I felt like he tried to, uh, tried to do what Henry Selleck had done with James from Giant Peach, uh, what he did with stop motion. But they tried to do it with uh, the rotoscope and Mark Rylance uh, playing the, the, the big friendly giant, which was great. But I feel that because of that, it lacked a connection with me and with, 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 with a lot of the crowd where I, where I did watch, watch the film who did admit that they uh, kind of in the first hour were nodding off to sleep where, where there's lots of, uh, lots of lights flying around the screen and not much story propelling forward. Um, I feel that uh, it, it, it clawed its way back towards the end uh, when Spielberg, I mean Spielberg is a director who is very edgy and very uh, pioneering but when he's on family friendly mode I feel that he does kind of rest on his laurels quite heavily and uh, he does pull it back but by the time it's pulled back and you're you're with the film I, it, it, it ends so for me I actually feel that the BFG is lower lower down the uh, the Roald Dahl rung for me and mm -hmm. I feel that um, it, 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 it probably is just uh, you know, kind of there with Charlie and the Cho Chocolate Factory by Tim Burton, which I, which I hate to say and I never expected to say. But uh, yeah, the BFG, I'm not the biggest fan of that, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, Jacob Stolworthy, it's been very informative. Thank you for joining us. No, oh, I'm glad. <laughs>the giant's original apron was switched for a waistcoat and he was in long boots until Blake received a parcel from Dahl one day containing his own Norwegian sandal. Now the character was complete. Walking through this exhibition, you really get a sense of the volume of Quentin Blake's work. What's on display here is just a fraction of what he produced, both on his own and working in collaboration with other writers. His collaboration with Roald Dahl was the most important. It lasted 13 years and resulted in 20 books. It's now almost impossible to think of Roald Dahl without conjuring Quentin Blake's images. Quentin Blake really, his, his pictures really add to the book actually. He's, he's so talented at just picking out the right things like the right bits of food stuck in Mr Twit's beard and, and uh, all those horrible things. I like the drawings because they do them very delicate. It's a twit. It's about these two ugly people 
who don't like each other and then and they fight all the time. It's funny as well. Now, 16 years after Roald Dahl's death, his creative partner and friend continues to bring words alive with his unmistakable illustrations. Bell Lupton, TRT World, Cardiff. That's it on this special edition of Showcase from TRT World Istanbul. We hope you've enjoyed our celebration of Roald Dahl's magical world of storytelling. I'm Özlem Şitan. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now.